Hello, this is the third part of our series studying the book that I wrote called A Heart on Fire, Rediscovering Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And in today's little presentation, we'll be going through chapters five and six, uh, the heart of the book, if you will, and uh, basically my favorite chapters of the book. The last time we talked, we, we spoke about how the Word of God is an entry into the heart of Jesus. If we use our imagination and not only enter into the gospel scenes, but try to enter into Jesus' interior, in that way we can begin to think and to feel as Jesus thought and felt, to have the same values, attitudes, and movements of his heart. And we use that, we do that through the imagination. I can't help thinking about one of the stories that we have in the Gospel of Luke. This is Luke chapter 24. It's after the uh, resurrection of Jesus in which Jesus suddenly appears and, as often happens, is not recognized by two of his disciples who are walking on a road to a town near Jerusalem called Emmaus. And remember how they were downcast? Jesus asks them what's wrong. They talk about how this great hero of theirs, Jesus, had died, had suffered at the hands of the Roman authorities, was rejected by the Jewish elders, and was crucified. And they had thought he would be the Messiah. And so Jesus explains to them, going through the Hebrew scriptures, all the ways that the prophet Isaiah, the Psalms, pointed to him as not a political messiah, but as a suffering messiah. So he said Jesus really did fulfill the mission that he was sent to do. And then they arrive at Emmaus, and they ask him to stay longer with them. They sit down to eat. Jesus and his love, and to prepare us for the second part of the celebration of the liturgy, the celebration of the Eucharist. So we begin with the liturgy of the word, and then we move to the liturgy of the Eucharist. And so every mass is a kind of celebration that shows us Luke chapter 24, Jesus opening the scriptures to us, setting our hearts on fire, and that prepares us to recognize him in the breaking of the bread, to see that when we celebrate that second part of the Mass, Jesus is making present his life-giving death and resurrection on the cross, and then giving himself to us in a holy communion. See how the Word prepares for the Eucharist. The Eucharist is really about the Sacred Heart of Jesus and vice versa. We could say that the Eucharistic devotion par excellence or the greatest Eucharistic devotion is the devotion to the heart of Jesus and that devotion to the heart of Jesus is really a Eucharistic devotion. And that's why it's a non-negotiable because the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life, as the Second Vatican Council said, so the devotion that we have to the heart of Jesus, and which is expressed in the Eucharist, they go together. And our devotion to the heart of Jesus helps us to celebrate the Eucharist in a deeper way. Why do we say that the you, that the uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a Eucharistic devotion? Well, uh, three reasons. One, the Eucharist is a gift that comes straight from the heart of Jesus. Remember in the Gospel of John chapter 19, Jesus has died, his body hangs on the cross, and a soldier comes and pierces his side, and blood 
and water gush forth. And these, traditionally, the church sees as the sacramental life of the church. Water representing baptism, blood representing the Eucharist. So you could say that the Eucharist is a gift that comes to us straight from the heart of Jesus. That's the first reason that we say Sacred Heart devotion is very Eucharistic. Secondly, the context for many of Jesus' appearances to people like St. Margaret Mary, St. Faustina, St. Lutgard, throughout history, when Jesus appeared to these people and revealed his heart to them, it was usually in the context of the Eucharist, where the Blessed Sacrament was exposed on the altar in a monstrance, or perhaps these people were praying in front of the tabernacle. But it was always an appearance connected with his Eucharistic presence. A third reason why we say that Eucharistic uh, devotion and Sacred Heart devotion go together is because of St. Margaret Mary and what Jesus said to her when he appeared to her. This is what's called the Great Revelation. Uh, it occurred in the year 1675. It was the third time that Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary. And when he appeared to her, this is how she describes it. One day, kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament during the octave, the eight days after Corpus Christi, I was deluged with God's loving favors, inspired to make some return and to give him love for love, I heard him say, do what I've already so often asked you to do. You can't show your love in a finer way than that. And he disclosed his divine heart to me. Now, what is it that Jesus had been asking St. Margaret Mary to do? To have a feast in honor of his sacred heart, celebrated eight days after the celebration of the feast in honor of his body and blood, Corpus Christi. Here's how he puts it, or at least the way St. Margaret Mary reports his words. That is why I am asking you to have the Friday after the octave of Corpus Christi set apart as a special feast in honor of my heart, a day on which to receive me in Holy Communion and make a solemn act of reparation for the indignities I have received in the Blessed Sacrament while exposed on the altars of the world. He called for a feast in honor of his Sacred Heart as a way of returning love for love, of making up for the coldness with which he had been treated in the Blessed Sacrament, being ignored when he is on the altars, being ignored when he is present in the tabernacle. And so this feast was a way of making up for the coldness of humanity toward his Eucharistic presence. So you see how this feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was connected to the feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Jesus. In the early church, the Church fathers, the early theologians of the church, often talked about sin in terms of hardness of heart. And Pope Benedict on Good Friday, the year 2007, after celebrating the Stations of the Cross, he said this, the fathers of the church considered insensitivity and hardness of heart the greatest sin of the pagan world. And they were fond of the prophet Ezekiel's prophecy. I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And we'll say more about that in a moment. But this hardness of heart, which is sin, that ignores Jesus' love, especially as that love is made present to us in the Eucharist, and that ignores the concerns of Jesus' heart, his love for his brothers and sisters, those for whom he laid down his life, this hardness of heart toward God and toward our neighbor, this sin requires a transformation of our hearts. It begins, as we said last time, in the Word, where we receive the Word of God, we enter into the heart of Jesus through the Word, and our hearts begin to be transformed. But we need something more. 
We need more than an attitude adjustment. We need to have a heart transplant. We need to have the hearts of stone taken out, as Ezekiel said, and replaced with a heart of flesh, a loving heart. Again, Ezekiel, in two places in the prophet Ezekiel, we hear God making this great promise. It was in chapter 11 and then in chapter 36. And it goes like this. God says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. That's the heart transplant that we're talking about. More than having our attitudes, our feelings, our um, sight, the way we look at other people, uh, more than having that transformed, we also need our very interior, our deepest interior transformed. And that happens in the Eucharist. We might ask, when was the prophet Ezekiel's prophecy about a new heart ever fulfilled? And you can go through the whole Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. I don't think you can find that prophecy ever being fulfilled. It was fulfilled in Jesus himself. When he gave us his heart on the cross, his heart was opened and blood and water gushed forth. He gave us new life on the cross. And at the Last Supper, he said, this is my body, this is my blood transforming bread and wine into his body and blood and saying, take and eat. He comes to us, body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist. And since he comes to us, the entire Jesus, we can say that he also gives us his sacred heart to transform our hearts in the Eucharist. This is when the prophecy of Ezekiel was fulfilled and we were given a new heart. But remember, this is, is not automatic. Uh, we need something more. We can't just say, well, now in Holy Communion, I've received the heart of Jesus. We have to recognize that and appreciate it and be open to receiving the transformation that the Lord wants to give us. I like to use the example of an outlet, an electrical outlet. It, it's there in the wall and it has great power. But in order for that power to work, you have to plug into it. The light won't go on unless you put the plug into the outlet. We can't just come to mass and be like plugs sitting there in the pews. We have to plug into the great power that is presented to us in the Eucharist. And we have a real problem, I think, in our celebration of the Eucharist today. And it's brought on by uh, two aspects. One is our culture. We live in a very entertainment-driven culture. And many people approach the celebration of the Eucharist as entertainment. They come wanting to be entertained by an engaging homily or to have music that lifts them up or uh, to have a strong sense of community. Uh, those are all very, very good things. But they're not what is essential in the Eucharist. What is essential is that in every Eucharist, Jesus is making present his life-giving death and resurrection on the cross. It's as though what he accomplished 2,000 years ago is made present to us today so that we can be as close to that act of love as the Apostle John was and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the few other women who stood under the cross. We are there present at Calvary. And the power of that life-transforming death and resurrection is given to us. But we have to be aware of it. And then when we come forth to Holy Communion with our hearts on fire, knowing the love of God through the word we have heard and through this, the making present of his death and resurrection, we come forward to receive his body and blood with hearts desiring to be transformed, to be more like his heart. And so that is the way we plug into the Eucharist. Uh, again, it's not entertainment. What am I getting out of the Eucharist? Though what we are getting out of the Eucharist is the greatest act of love the world has ever known. 
and Jesus' own body and blood and new heart. But it's not about entertainment. It's our worship and our prayer. The second problem that we have when we approach the celebration of the Eucharist is that it can become routine. If we go every Sunday, if we go more often during the week, it can become a routine. It's like celebrating Christmas once a week or every day. Uh, we can get minds that glaze over and forget the amazing miracle that is being celebrated there in every Eucharist. And so it's very important for us to be actively engaged in the Eucharist, to not just sit there and to strive not to space out. I say that speaking for myself. It's so easy, even for a priest, to go on autopilot and to read the words rather than to pray the words. And for those who are in the pews listening, it's so important not just to hear the words, but to listen to them and to pray the Mass with the priest. Pope Benedict spoke about this in um, a letter, not a letter, but a video message that he sent to the Eucharistic Congress in Dublin, Ireland. This was in 2012, um, within a year of his own resignation. And he sent a beautiful video message to the Eucharistic Congress that was meeting in Ireland. And he talked about how the changes in the liturgy that occurred after the Council were designed to, as he puts it, promote the full and active participation of the faithful in the Eucharistic sacrifice, the offering of Jesus on the altar to the Father, the offering of Jesus on the cross that is made present on the altar. And he says, it's clear, a great deal has been achieved, but it's equally clear that there have been many misunderstandings. He said, the renewal of the external forms was intended to make it easier to enter into the inner depth of the mystery. You hear those words, inner depth? What I hear there is into the heart of the mystery, into the heart of Jesus. He goes on and says, while these renewal of the forms was intended to do this, and that its true purpose was to lead people to a personal encounter with the Lord present in the Eucharist, so that through this contact with Christ's love, their love for their brothers and sisters might increase. He says, while this was the intention, yet he writes and says, not infrequently, the revision of liturgical reforms remained at an external level, and active participation has been confused with external activity. In other words, many people have come to think of the participation, active participation in the celebration of the Eucharist only in terms of sitting, standing, kneeling, responding, singing, but we can do that without our minds and our hearts really engaged. And that's what's called for, is that our, we bring our hearts to the Eucharistic celebration and our minds, and we're attentive, and we're open to the graces the Lord wants to give us. This is why I believe Euch uh, Eucharistic devotion and Sacred Heart devotion go together. If our hearts can be on fire, and if our hearts can be warmed and prepared for the Eucharistic celebration, then we will, quote, get more out of the Eucharist. We will be more open to the grace of transformation that is given to us in every Eucharistic celebration. Pope Benedict talked about this transformation of our hearts in that Good Friday uh, celebration after the Stations of the Cross. He put it this way, he says, by following Jesus on the way of his passion, we not only see the passion of Jesus, but we also see the suffering in the world. And this is the profound intention of the prayer of the way of the cross, to open our hearts and to help us to see with our heart. And I would say this is also the intention of being present, truly present, in every celebration of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. 
He goes on, being converted to Christ, becoming Christian meant and means to us receiving a heart of flesh, a heart sensitive to the passion and suffering of others. So he says, let us pray to the Lord for all the suffering people of the world. Let us pray that he will truly give us a heart of flesh and that he will make us messengers of his love, not only with words, but with our entire life. When we gather for the celebration of the Eucharist and we see that great act of love that Jesus makes present to us, we offer ourselves with him to the Father for the salvation of souls. That's what the celebration of the Eucharist truly means. And this is what our celebration calls us to. Pope Francis said a very similar thing uh, last year. Actually, this was on, uh, in February 2014. And, you know, every day the Holy Father, Pope Francis, celebrates uh, a mass uh, in a little chapel for people. And um, the uh, Vatican Radio picks this up and they uh, publish excerpts from his homily. And this particular homily was entitled, At Mass Without a Watch. I think that's a very telling title, At Mass Without a Watch, because again, so often we come to the Eucharistic celebration uh, getting our obligation out of the way, rather than being present to this great act of love. And so Pope Francis, at the conclusion of his little homily, said this, Ask the Lord today to give us a sense of what is sacred, to understand that it is one thing to pray at home, to pray in church, to pray the rosary, to pray many beautiful prayers, to do the way of the cross, to read the Bible. But it is quite another to celebrate the Eucharist. In this celebration, we enter into the mystery of God, as Pope Benedict put it, the interior of the mystery of God, into his heart. And he says, he, the God made flesh in Jesus and made present to us in the Eucharist, he is the only one. He is the glory. He is in power. And we ask for the grace that he may teach us how to enter more deeply into this mystery so that our hearts may then be transformed. With hearts that are transformed then, we go forth and we carry on the work of Jesus. We don't have to wear a little wristband with WWJD, what would Jesus do, to remind us, okay, we want to live as Christ would live, but our hearts have been transformed and that affects our entire life. Now, through this transformation that comes through the word and the sacrament, we can say, as St. Paul said to the Galatians, chapter 2, verse 20, now I live, not I, but Christ who lives in me. We can say, now I live a new life because I have this new heart beating within my heart. And this flows into the next chapter of our book, Chapter 6, which is my favorite chapter. The reason it's my favorite is because it's about reparation. And this is something that many people do not understand. It's a word that we don't use very much anymore. But I think it's essential to both our devotion to the heart of Jesus, our celebration of the Eucharist, and our daily life. What do we mean by reparation? Basically, it means to continue the work of Jesus. And what is the work of Jesus? Reconciliation. In John chapter 20, Jesus appeared to the apostles on the first Easter Sunday, and his first words were, peace be with you. And he showed them his wounds to convince them that it was really he, Jesus, risen from the dead, but also to say, this is how much I loved you. I was willing to suffer and die to reconcile you and the world to my Father. And then Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus sends the apostles. He sends the church. He sends you and he sends me to carry on his work of reconciliation, to bring forgiveness into the world. And part of the way that we do that is through acts of penance, where we make up for the wrong that has been done in our world. That's one of the ways of looking at reparation. It means to make up for something that was done. And again, we can look at St. Margaret Mary and the words of Jesus to her. Um, Jesus called for this feast of the Sacred Heart, a feast of reparation, and it was to make up for the coldness that he experienced from people. Here's how he put it in his uh, second revelation, which occurred in 1674. He says, all my eager efforts for people's welfare are met with nothing but coldness and dislike. Do me the kindness then, you at least, of making up for all their ingratitude as far as you can. So to make up for the ingratitude, the coldness, the rejection on the part of people that Jesus shed his blood for and died. And he goes on to say, do this by asking mercy for sinners. And in this way, you will also in some way soothe the heartache that I felt when my apostles deserted me. So we have that image of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asking the apostles to pray with him and to pray for him as he engaged in that battle uh, where he, he sweat blood and they fell asleep. And so Jesus is saying, make up for their lack of awareness, their lack of gratitude. And he calls all of us to do the same, to again, make up for the coldness in our world, the ingratitude in our world. But there's more. Another way of, of looking at this reparation is to repair the damage of sin. Sin has terrible consequences in the lives of individuals, in families, in society at large, in our world. Uh, if we were to read the newspaper in light of identifying sin, uh, you could say it's all over the place. And our call is to make up for the sin in our world, to repair the damage. One's reaction might be, well, I didn't do that. We are all sinners. Jesus, the sinless one, did not add to the weight of guilt in the world, to the evil in the world. He is without sin. And he, the one without sin, made up for the sin of the world, repaired the damage of sin with his own offering of himself on the cross and his resurrection. He invites us now, his body, to continue that work. So we do this by offering acts of penance, but also with our prayer and with our way of life. In different recovery programs like AA and other 12-step groups, um, one of the steps in the 12-step program is to make amends. And it's been said that one of the best amends is not just to say to the person, I'm sorry for hurting you, but to live in such a way that you show you're sorry. It's not enough simply to go to confession and to confess our sins and to, to say to the Lord, I'm sorry. We have to show that we are sorry by living a different life, by making acts of penance, trying to make up for the sins that we have committed. In the chapter on reparation, I, I have some great quotes from Pope Benedict uh, about reparation, about God. Uh, I really think they will help people understand um, God's justice and God's mercy. And the image that I, I like to use most often is that of a broken window. Uh, let's say a boy hits a baseball, it breaks a window, he goes to the man who owns the house and says, I'm sorry, I broke your window. And the man says, I forgive you. But then the man says, now we have to repair the window. And so to help me repair that window, I ask you to pay for the new window that is going to go there. That's reparation, 
paying for what was done wrong. And in that way, we balance the wrong with something that is good. We balance the evil with good. That is the work of reparation. So we're called to continue this work of reparation, and it's a very powerful prayer. We might think, well, how can I add anything to the perfect act of Jesus, his perfect act of reparation when he sacrificed himself on the cross? And St. Paul addresses this in his letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, the church. We might ask, what could possibly be lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, the church? And obviously, there's nothing lacking in terms of uh, Jesus saving the world. Uh, what he did was perfect, and it attained the salvation of the world. But the world continues to sin. The world continues to reject the salvation Christ won for it. And now we play a part in the world receiving the salvation Christ won for it. We play a part in repairing the damage that sin does in the world. You could say the one thing lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, the church, is our own participation in them. That means that when suffering comes our way, and we'll speak more about this, uh, when suffering comes our way, we can make an offering of it. And in that way, joined to the cross, we continue the work of salvation. Our prayers and sacrifices can make a difference. And we have to trust that when we unite ourselves to Jesus in living out this offering that we make every time we celebrate Mass, in which we renew in the daily offering, something we'll talk about next time, uh, that when we do this, our lives have great significance and carry on this work of reparation. Before I close, I want to say two more things about reparation from a perspective of um, the Holy Father. Uh, Pope Benedict wrote a letter on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the great encyclical letter of Pope Pius XII on the um, Sacred Heart of Jesus. This was dated May 15th, uh, 2006. And in the first page of his letter, he quotes St. John Paul II. And he's talking about how in the heart of Christ, our hearts learn how to know the meaning of life, to know our destiny, to understand the value of Christian life. And then he goes on and says, the true reparation asked by the heart of the Savior will come when the civilization of the heart of Christ can be built upon the ruins heaped up by hatred and violence. It's a beautiful image of our world that our world is a civilization that's crumbling. We thought we could build this world simply by human means. And what we see is that it leads to destruction. Pope Benedict often said that without God, nothing goes well. And so he, quoting St. John Paul II, says, true reparation means building the civilization of the heart of Jesus, the civilization of love on the ruins left by sin and evil in our world. Father Peter Hans Kolvenbach who was the general of the Jesuits during that same time, uh, said this, in this time of hatred and violence, of injustice and discrimination, the reparation due to the Lord is authentic only if it integrates concern for the poor, promotion of justice, love for the little ones, respect for life. In other words, Reparation is not simply a pious practice, and it's not simply a prayer or doing penance, but it, uh, it affects our daily life and what we are going to do with our lives and in our lives. We don't want to add to 
the evil in our world. Rather, we want to balance out the evil with good. And that calls for a transformation of our hearts, a transformation of our lives, a transformation that is made possible because of the Eucharist. Word and sacrament transforming us. And the more we can recognize Jesus' heart present in the Eucharist, allow that heart to transform us so that we then recognize the body of Christ present in the world, the more we will add to the good in the world and build the civilization of love. We want to make reparation to the ingratitude with which the heart of Jesus is treated in the Blessed Sacrament and the way the body of Christ is treated in our brothers and sisters who are victims of sin and evil in our world. Next week, we'll continue with a discussion about how we can live the Eucharist in our daily lives. Thank you for being part of this book study, and may God bless you in the coming weeks. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.